This is the social and online uh, media panel. Um, so we can talk about that sort of venue as a way of in which academics or scholars uh, more generally can potentially uh, impact the marketplace of ideas. And we have a great panel. Um, we're going to start with Rob Farley, uh, who teaches at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he has a book that just came out, which has the best subtitle of any book I've ever seen, called Grounded, The Case for Abolishing the United States Air Force. <laughs> um, he's also published very widely in a variety of, of outlets, including The Guardian, uh, The American Prospect, Foreign Policy, and The Korea Times. Uh, to my immediate left is Sarah Kenzior. Um, did I get that pronounced yeah, right? Excellent. I am on a roll. Um, and is someone who I honestly say I'm not sure I would have invited you here if it was not for the fact that Twitter existed and did not sort of, you know, st you know stumble upon you uh, and upon your work uh, uh, via uh, Twitter. Uh, she's a writer who covers uh, politics, media, and the economy. Uh, she is, has a PhD in anthropology uh, from Washington University and an MA in Central Eurasian Studies from Indiana University. Uh, she's a columnist for Al Jazeera English uh, as well as the Hot Chronicle of Higher Education uh, and has also written for Foreign Policy, The Atlantic, uh, Politico and Slate. Um, she's also a program associate for the Central Asia program at the Elliott School uh, um, of International Affairs at George Washington University. Um, to my far right uh, is Mira Sukarov, um, who's an associate professor of political science at Carleton University uh, in Ottawa, Canada, uh, where she also has the distinction of being a provost teaching fellow. Uh, she's the author of The International Self, Psychoanalysis and the Search for Israeli-Palestinian Peace, uh, which came out in 2005. Uh, she's also uh, a relatively prolific scholar blogger and wrote a great piece in PS uh, a couple of years ago about the effect of having to blog uh, about Israel-Palestine issues if, in fact, you have some degree of Israeli identity. Um, Dr. Sukarov won a 2010 Rockover Award from the American Jewish Press Association uh, and has also blogged for Haaretz and the Jewish Daily Forward. And to my far left uh, is Zainab Tufekci. I'm not going to introduce her again because you already all know about her. Uh, You're just so going to make me work because I didn't go to Tuscany. <laughs> yeah. In return for not going to Tuscany, I put you on two panels. So, you know, that's, that's the way I reward you. Um, but, Rob, the floor is yours. All right. I'm sure Mira is pleased to be called to your far right. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, start off with, is social media the answer? And the, the, the answer to that question must obviously be the answer to what and um, maybe, uh, sort of, uh, is the only way we can go with it. Um, I guess starting off with two related anecdotes, uh, late last year, an acquaintance of mine uh, published a book, Excellent Press, uh, did very well, excellent book, she's an excellent scholar. Um, and I asked her, you know, would she be interested in my help with any kind of promotion, you know, even promoting the link on Twitter, or anything along those lines. And her reaction was immediate and visceral. Uh, it was, no, I hate my book. I never want to revisit anything about my book. Uh, and I would never uh, sort of think about writing or doing an interview or anything associated with, uh, with what I wrote and published and will probably get tenure for. Um, and this struck me as understandable. Uh, and I think that for a lot of scholars, this is going to be the case, that after you've been with uh, something that was your dissertation and sort of you've, uh, you've, you've been with something for so long, you, you can generate a visceral dislike of it. Um, but it also struck me as unproductive, that this was not um, a way that academics should be thinking about, uh, about putting their ideas into the public sphere and about engaging with just about anybody who might uh, be interested in reading them. Um, and it re reminded me of a conversation I had with Steve Biddle uh, about 14 years ago. I know some of you have been to SWAMO, or at least some of the academics have been to SWAMOs as well, and he usually gives this talk that whenever you put together any sort of project, you should think in terms of a book and an article and a 2,000 word think piece and a 600 word op-ed. Um, and that putting all of these together um, will give your ideas the greatest purchase uh, they can um, in terms of finding the, the largest and most diverse audiences uh, that you can for what you're thinking, for what you want to argue for your work. Now, and I think this relates back to the two panels ago, in the year 2000, that was kind of edgy, right? The suggestion that academics, right, career academics, not necessarily policy-oriented academics, should be thinking in terms of uh, diversifying their work so much that they prepare short pieces for it for a public audience was not really how we thought about it in my graduate program, was not how we thought about it in a lot of graduate programs. Um, but 
and I guess this is why I found my first conversation so surprising, um, we have come a long way in how we conceive of what an academic project is over the past 15 years. Um, this latest book that I wrote about the Air Force um, started with an article in a popular magazine in 2007. Uh, it moved on from there with a bunch of different blog posts. Um, now it has uh, its own Twitter feed, it has its own Facebook feed, it has uh, an uh, article in Foreign Affairs, an online article in Foreign Affairs. Um, it has, you know, a hundred different angry uh, Twitter and Facebook diatribes against it, um, a variety of, of nasty responses, um, and some positive responses. Um, and the way that I think about this, and sort of more broadly, the relationship between an academic project and public engagement is to frame it in terms of the long process of peer review. Um, the long process of peer review has existed since before we had social media because any work that was worth doing you always took to a conference and you always communicated to some colleagues here or there and you got comments back from them and you integrated their work and they were remembered in the little comment section at the very beginning of the book or in the acknowledgments or whatever. Um, but what the long social media oriented project of peer review does is it opens up that process to a much wider audience, um, an audience that uh, is sort of by its by its nature much more diverse um, with respect to how they're going to, going to approach your work. Um, an audience which can be much more negative and hostile. Right? You, you get negative reviews of work in from journals, you get negative reviews of work from conferences, but at least those are your people. Um, I get negative reviews of my work from angry, angry Air Force colonels. Um, and that's productive. That's productive because that's the sort of thing that if I didn't have Facebook and if I didn't have Twitter, I didn't have a variety of other outlets, I would not have received. And so um, the process, the, the, the too long process of uh, writing this book and of creating a uh, framework for engagement around this book, a framework for um, asking people to engage with it, asking people to talk about it, asking people to give it uh, more than a second thought, um, not only improves that engagement but also um, improves the work itself, right? It makes in the end for a much better set of work. Um, and so a way of framing that in terms of an academic career, in terms of what uh, I think some of the other panelists have discussed earlier today, is that it's not an either or between rigor and uh, relevance, right? That in ter when, when, you, when you open up your work to a broader audience and when you make your work available to a broader audience, you actually get good comments from angry Air Force colonels, right? And the Unproductive ones are helpful and the productive ones are helpful because the unproductive ones make you hone your arguments and make you uh, eliminate uh, key, uh, key errors in fact or key errors in argument. And the productive ones who want to engage with it and who want to improve your work obviously also uh, improve that work. And so there's this simultaneous process of making your work more relevant and making your work more rigorous that is available to us uh, now that we have a, this broad uh, universe of social media to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get our work out there and to make our work available. And so um, it's also worth noting that uh, this makes a particular research project far more uh, all-encompassing and time-consuming and demanding uh, of your life than was the case uh, with a book that or with the research project that you, you, you conceive of maybe 20 years ago before we have uh, all of these outlets. Um, because you know, in addition now to uh, all of the stuff that Steve Biddle talked about whenever, I get interviews, I have to do podcasts, I have to do blogging heads, I have to do all of this other stuff and I have to answer. If somebody writes an angry diatribe against me on Twitter at 11.30 p.m., I would like to be able to go to sleep, but I can't, right? Because I just can't sleep angry. And so it becomes, a, much more difficult to uh, cordon off an aspect of your life and say this is my work and this is my research um, and maybe here is my activism or here is uh, what I'm trying to do in terms of policy relevance. And so there's certainly a cost, but there's also a clearly a benefit in terms of engagement, in terms of the value of the work. Um, 
you know, moving forward, uh, we're moving on to a new project, and I just today started a new Twitter feed for that project where I can start um, following the corporations that we're studying, and I can start uh, engaging with the people who study the same thing to see what they're talking about, um, to see what they're thinking about, um, you know, start listing the itty bitty parts that we've already done and getting people to uh, engage with those, and especially to tell me what they think is right about those and what they think is wrong about those. Um, this, again, is simultaneously going to make the project harder to do, but it's going to make it a better project, and it's going to make it a project that more people are paying attention to. Um, and so all of these, again, go together, rigor, relevance, and, uh, and engagement with uh, social media. It's, it's not something that's necessarily either or. It could, perhaps could be, but it's not necessarily either or. Okay. You finished under time, too, which I'm really happy about. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Okay. Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. The question of how academics engage with the public is hard to address because conceptions of both the academic and the public are being transformed, not only by the proliferation of digital media, but by the collapse of the economy. In a decimated job market, being an academic is not something you choose. It's a designation committees of strangers decide for you, a designation you lose without an institutional affiliation. This is the reality of academic life for most young scholars. They occupy an intellectual gray zone, the boundaries of which are determined by institutional affiliation and personal wealth. Whether to publish in an academic journal or write for the broader public is less an issue of personal choice as a financial incentive. When you look at whether scholars are using digital media to share their ideas, you need to look at systems of publication available to them and their respective benefits and costs. We need to look critically at a system where the ability to prohibit scholarship is often valued more than the ability to produce it. In academia, publishing has long been a strategic enterprise. But in an era of massive media expansion and massive job loss, publishing has become less about the production of knowledge than where that knowledge is held or withheld and what effect that has on the author's career. New professors are awarded tenure based on the prestige and number of peer-reviewed publications, but rarely on the impact of their research on the world, perhaps because due to academic paywalls, it's usually minimal. Publish or perish has long been an academic maxim. In the digital economy, publish and perish may be a more apt refrain. What academics gain in career advancement by publishing behind a paywall, they lose in public relevance, a sad fate for scholars who want their research appreciated and understood. Over the past decade, some tenure track faculty, like these two, have started rejecting this model, pushing for open access journals and using social media and blogs to share their ideas with a broader audience. For academics with job security, the matter of where to publish is a choice. But for the graduate students and contingent faculty that now make up the majority of academics, academic publishing is starting to look less like a strategy than a bad bet. In order to land a job, younger scholars are instructed to publish jargon-filled research in paywall journals, publications that end up shielding their work from the public eye. Scholars who bet on that insular system usually find themselves stranded when that system fails them, as it does most. When these scholars leave academia, they relinquish the ability to participate in academic intellectual exchange, since most cannot afford to pay for access to scholarly work, including their own. We've created a publishing system in which academic debate is often removed from those who initiated it, after they can no longer pay to play. For example, if I wanted to download my own articles, I'd have to pay $183. If I wanted to access and read the articles that have cited my work since I left academia, I'd be out about $1,000. The purpose of this expensive paywall is not for the databases which hold my academic papers to make money, since people generally refuse to pay such a high price for access to individual articles. The high price maintains the barrier between academia and the outside world. Paywalls codify and commodify tacit elitism. So that's what publishing looks like from the perspective of the faltering academic job market. What's more interesting is how this plays out for the public, because as hard as it may be to pin down who counts as an academic 
in a time of rampant contingency and unemployment, it's even harder to anticipate the audience of academic work. I believe that this audience consists and has always consisted of potentially anyone. The main reason academic work hasn't gained broader traction is not because of lack of interest, but lack of access. People like to argue that academic articles are not in the public's interest, but how would we even know? We cannot debate what's in the public interest if the public has no way to discover what interests them. And under the current paywall system, this is impossible for them to do. When academic research is made available to a broader public, it often attracts wide interest. Unfortunately, it tends to be mediated through so-called explainer journalism whose authors poorly comprehend the material that they are attempting to explain. For example, I've read explainer journalism on Central Asia that vouched for the region's low level of income inequality, poverty, and racism. They were full of factual inaccuracies and misreadings of the original academic studies from which they drew. But because these studies are locked behind a paywall, there's no way for an audience to access or assess them, so they have to rely on a journalist's erroneous explanation. This is why it would be beneficial for academics to write summaries of their own work and to practice broader public engagement. At the very least, they'll protect themselves from misrepresentation. Before the conference, Dan had sent out a question to us, um, to the panelists, asking whether digital media had fragmented the audience for academic work. I don't think that this is the case. When you argue that an audience has become fragmented by digital media, that assumes that some sort of coherent audience, drawing from a set body of work, had previously existed. The audience for academic research is diverse and unpredictable, and social media is simply what allows us to see that. Social media also allows intellectuals who are not academics and who cannot afford the credentials that allow them to participate in certain intellectual pursuits to make their ideas known. At the heart of this debate is the perceived legitimacy of knowledge. Do we judge ideas by the credentials and institutional affiliations of the people who hold them? Or do we judge ideas on merit and respect the individual based on their ideas? Only through media open to the public do we have the ability to do the latter. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Mira, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Dan. Thanks again for inviting me to be here today. So the great thing about going in the afternoon session is that everyone is sort of sleepy and so might, might be uh, more gentle in the Q&A period, but mostly because there have been so many points that have been raised earlier that I've just been dying to respond to and not necessarily <laughs> refute, but to sort of build on. And so I want to open by doing that. So forgive a bit of ground clearing, but you'll soon see how it links into what I really want to say. So what I want to say has to do with the role of a scholar blogger in the social media sphere, not only in transmitting formal academic research to the broader public, but how to engage with our own, perhaps, ethno-national subjectivities, in my case, as a scholar blogger on the Israel-Palestine conflict, how to engage with one's other subjectivities, whether personal, political, or, philosoph or philosophical, and then I want to touch a little bit on the moral question that I asked the editors of uh, the policy journals we heard from earlier. And I'll talk ultimately about thinking about the following phrase, and I'll elaborate later, the truth of human experience. But first, I just want to say something about Nick Kristoff. And it's not just because <laughs> he retweeted me. But I'm just puzzled over the fact that when his piece came out, I read it. I think I read it because I follow my Facebook, so I think I read it before all the blowback started pouring in, and I was thrilled. And then the blowback started pouring in, and I realized my colleagues and my peers weren't thrilled at all. They were, they were peeved. And I think it has to do with why was I thrilled? I was thrilled because to me it was fundamentally a great affirmation of what people like me and people like us are doing, and that is that scholar <coughs> blogging is being... Uh, invited, appreciated, rewarded. Now, of course, is it being rewarded back in our profession? Because Nick Kristoff's not our dean, he's not our provost. These are questions we can think about. Perhaps why my peers weren't as happy is perhaps they've moved beyond that. They're more secure in their identities of scholar bloggers or of publicly engaged intellectuals, and now they're worried more about whether people are hearing them the way they want to be heard. So another thing I'll want to talk about is our professional identities. The other thing is the thrust of the conference so far has been about policy relevance. For me, I want to flip this on its head a little bit. 
when I blog, when I write about public issues of the day, let's use the Israel-Palestine conflict as an example, I'm not necessarily trying to make sure that I'm being heard by practitioners, though I would be happy if my memos reached their desk, so to speak. I know that I'm really trying to reach hearts and minds, of which practitioners are examples. I know that I want to influence the communities who are passionate about these things, and they may be scholarly communities if I'm engaged in a scholarly debate. More often, they're diaspora communities. They're the activists and the emotional and political stakeholders of the conflict of which I'm writing about. And as often, they may be the actual conflict actors themselves if the uh, actors in those regions are choosing to read English media, right? So the paper I write for, when I write for the Israeli Daily Haaretz, I write for the English version. So I know the chances are the um, Israelis, the citizens themselves, are not necessarily reading me, but there's a feedback loop from the diaspora communities back into the regional actors themselves. Now, um, the other thing is I wanted to respond to is Peter Fever's point about peer review research never being the last word and one knows that one's graduate student or someone else's graduate student will soon come by with a better data set with a refinement of your theoretical perspective and of course that is indeed the way the scholarly conversation proceeds. I can't help but think and feel the opposite though when I'm blogging and that is when I'm engaged in peer review journal writing there is the culture of that kind of writing is that every stone must have been turned and every possible and potential criticism must be addressed and of course we have the scourge of many 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 footnotes and many 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 references and we know the, that game when I write my blogs and this again is a little bit different from what Zainab said is you talked about the culture of certainty that encompasses the dynamic of punditry and I know mm. what you mean I wonder if that's more common on broadcast channels yeah. when I do broadcast I feel like I have to be saying something certain I think that's why I prefer print in print I can be uncertain and I value that I value the uncertainty because I value right now in my the stage I'm at and maybe it's the age I'm at and maybe it's the age my kids are at and we can you know psychoanalyze me and think about what's really going on with me but I value being able to ask questions often or more than being able to have the definitive answer that's where I'm at right now and scholar blogging gives me that opportunity now this isn't to say that I don't have answers and now here's where I want to get into some of the risks and challenges of scholar blogging I used to uh, when I was doing only academic writing be very drawn to explanatory work and it was very safe there. There's a real objectivity. Um, there's a real sense of being insulated from being too political, being too moral, being too ethical. Now I know that when I blog, I'm getting more into moments of moral outrage. We may call those WTF questions, right, in the three letters that are used in social media. Get very frustrated, want to call out political actors on what they're doing. Get very frustrated, want to call out diaspora communities on their intransigence, whatever the case may be. So there, of course, is the, there's the concern that as you get more morally prescriptive, you, you, you leave the confines of the objectivity that you're supposed to embrace as an academic. So, but think about what um, Justin and Ben said this morning. Um, now, if you're, if you're a legal scholar or you're a professional ethicist or you're a moral philosopher, you've got frameworks, ready and well-honed frameworks to answer moral and ethical questions. But what if you don't? What if you're not one of those? I'm a political scientist, international relations specialist. What do I have by my training? Because I certainly am bothered by moral questions about what's really going on in these conflict zones and elsewhere politically. What I know I have is uh, a sense of the experience of the actors on the ground. I have a political attunement to what I'm calling more often when I teach, when I write, the truth of human experience. And so if I could pitch my prescriptions, my normative... Uh, instincts, the ideas that cycle between my mind and my heart, in my own case, in that framework with what do the actors want and need, think of it in terms of empathy, think of it in terms of narratives, think of it in terms of ethnography, um, anthropological investigation, then I feel I'm on solid ground. And so I feel, I think, that that is the kind of science that the journal article, journal editors we heard from are looking for, but I don't know, right? Because human experience is a broad thing and sometimes it's, it's based on instinct and based on listening and 
the um, evidence might be anecdotal, the deeper and more um, nuanced you go. Finally, what I do worry about is getting locked into particular policy positions and getting locked into the cult of the center. So because I advocate a middle ground solution, it's now middle ground, it used to be considered far left or based on the hate mail I get, either it's considered far left or far right, depending on who's emailing me at that point at midnight on Twitter, but let's just call it the two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. There can be a sense that one gets locked into this cult of moderation such that one may not be able to see other possible solutions. One might think that one's moderation makes one wiser and more prudent um, and broader uh, observing than one really is. So I'll leave it with that and I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Mary. I appreciate it. Zanip? Me? I'll start off from where she left off and go into I think question of budget plus the good one. So I, I think peer review certainly has weaknesses but great strengths. So blogging has weaknesses and great strengths. Being on things something like national broadcast media, great outreach, but yeah, you have to have your, you know, what's your elevator pitch version of what you're saying. And I think what I've benefited most has been trying to do some of each. Uh, tr uh, I definitely blog with my questions. I find the same value in sort of blogging and this, eh, here's where it's going. Uh, when you're on broadcast media, you don't usually get the long sort of complicated debate. But although when you're writing, you can. So the longer print version definitely has that. So, you know, we just sort of meander through those things depending on what stage you are, what the question is, how certain you are, whether you're asking a question, advocating a position. But, you know, just talking about all of this brings up another kind of question of budget besides the one that Sarah was talking about, which is certainly very important. It's the budget of time. And that, I think, is the sort of big, and it, you know, time is directly related to money. It's not the same thing, because as even if you're the richest person, you still have 24 hours. But if you do have money, you have more of those 24 hours to do more of your choices as opposed to certain other things. Um, so I, that's the part that I have no solution to, and I'm not sure anybody does. Um, I have the privilege in two ways. One is that you know I am not in the contingent faculty track, which gives me a lot more freedom. I'm not tenured, but I'm still you know on a reasonable tenure track job, a great one in fact. Uh, and I also study social media, so being on social media is not as much of a um, redirect from what I do anyway. So you know I'm sometimes keeping an eye on something happening somewhere and also tweeting. People are like, how do you tweet so much? Well, I study the thing, so <laughs> it kind of works out for me. But in spite of all of that, I find myself at a great time crunch and I have to constantly think about what am I going to turn down? I know this sounds like, you know, first world blogger problems, but it's a real problem because, well, what happens when like, you know, just sort of bring it down to how it works yesterday um, the Tur there was a columnist in Turkey that got 10 months in jail for, well, a single letter in a tweet, basically, that turned the word into an off-color um, insult, and then the prime minister of Turkey sued, and he's got 10 months jail sentence now. And yesterday, he, our prime minister of Turkey also gave an interview to Charlie Rose. When something like that happens, now that I have managed to become the academic person on these topics, what ends up happening is my phone starts ringing off the hook because it's a catchy subject and Twitter's a fad and everybody wants to write about Turkey. Two years ago, people ignored it. And I face this in, I have an R&R &R due. I have a you know, great article that has great suggestions from a peer reviewer. And I'm coming here. I mean, which one am I going to put off and which one am I going to do? So even when social media is the answer, there is the question of, well, what other questions am I not answering by choosing this path? And because I am comfortably employed, I take certain shortcuts. I take cabs instead of this or that. You know, I do all sorts of things that really add up to how much time I have, except the day is still 24 hours and you know, other uh, considerations. 
in the, the sad, so, so I'm going to tie it back to uh, Sarah's question, which is like there's other kinds of budgets, you know, which academic article. I mean, the paywalls are, um, it's a criminal waste of human capacity to educate them and have them go deep on a topic for six, seven, eight, nine years and then say, sorry, you're unemployed, you can no longer read what you yourself wrote or things. It's just, um, so there's these, you know, other budgets that people have to think about. So it's a good question to have is that we have an answer of sorts, but we don't really have, you know, Henry was getting at this, we don't really have uh, figured out the budget for it, either time-wise for the comfortably employed, or just money-wise for the large numbers of uh, people who've become the, you know, the, the, the mode academic now is a contingent faculty person, right? How do we do that? Um, and what we're losing w with that is not just the human capital, whatever you want to call it, we're losing a lot of voices that I think would be great contributors to this debate because uh, what are we not seeing? You know, what kind of knowledge is not being getting, getting out there publicly? I think my path is sort of a proof that if you do reach out, there can be great interest in academic work. And if you're thinking, well, you're working on a faddish thing, that is true now. Ask me about seven years ago when people thought I was crazy for studying what I was studying, that it was just really ignored and marginalized and now it's kind of swung. Um, so I think, and even seven, eight years ago, I think I could have found larger communities had social media had been developed. Whatever you're studying, there's a, some people out there who would like to hear from it. Question is, and this is a great question for people who are running departments, people uh, just sort of for public policy makers and generalists, how do we harness this? so that it doesn't just end up being this individualized burden where you're making choice after choice on what do you not do, what do you give up. Uh, my academic publishing, uh, we went back in the panel, we discussed this, I am publishing at a you know, club to clear you know, my tenure review, I just got reappointed at my school, but I'm certainly not publishing as much as I could uh, given the day is 24 hours, and I feel comfortable about it because I do work at a place where public engagement is part of my review, and that's fine, and this is a choice I made personally. Well, what if I was borderline with my, you know, we, these are really important questions. How do we get our work out there? And because the rewards are great, I, I do agree. Like, this is the thing we're talking about. I do really think, and this is where I'm going to get, uh, where I want to say, we're overly defensive sometimes. I think that kind of you know studying something in depth, yes, sometimes by using methods other people don't necessarily understand. I mean, do we really want climate scientists not to use complicated models? We don't, right? There's value in sometimes complicated models. There's value in going deep into a question. There's value in studying arcane questions. Who knows what they'll contribute, right? Basic research sometimes works like that. Um, and now we have tools to get out there but the incentive structures really need thinking about, and the fact that I have so far been somewhat lucky doesn't change the fact that the incentive structures aren't that encouraging necessarily um, to everyone else out there that we've been hearing about and who's not in this room. So I don't have an answer. I think we have um, great, I, let me put it this way. I think we have, is social media the answer? Well, yes, but not to every question we're facing out here, and it'd be great to bring those conversations into, and so that I could end up. Okay. Uh, well, these are a provocative set of uh, uh, presentations. I've got a couple questions, but I want to see if anyone else has, in the audience has any first. Um, I was going to bring this up at the end sorry, of the Sorry, Kelly, can you introduce yourself? Because oh, I don't think you did it last time, and I want oh, everyone sorry. to know who you are. Kelly yeah. Sims Gallagher. I'm in the faculty here at the Kennedy School. And I'm in the Energy You mean the Fletcher Dep School. Sorry. <laughs> 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 what did I say, Energy? Cycle. You said Kennedy. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> you used to be at the Kennedy School. We have smartly... No, my head is spinning as I think of. So I used to be at the Kennedy School, and now I'm at the Fletcher School, and I work on energy and environmental policy. Um, and I'm thinking about time, mm. and um, I was really struck by this in the last panel as well, and trying to decide if I should save this up for when I'm speaking on the last panel. Uh, but I really think it's an acute problem for uh, busy 
you know, successful professors who are being asked to do so many things all at once, uh, being asked to work on, you know, tenure publications and even post-tenure, you know, there's still a lot of pressure to be, uh, you know, succeeding in the field and then students and doing a good job of teaching and what that entails and that's very cyclical but in times very extreme um, and then, um, you know, producing major things and then getting them, doing the outreach, right? And so, you know, I was really struck thinking about my experience, um, just I have a new book out um, right here, and I've been writing, uh, you know, various pieces, and you send them into places like foreign policy or, you know, I just sent an op-ed into the Boston Globe, and it goes into the ether and you don't know what happened, and it is, a waste of time and that just kills me because I have no time. So to me this is the essence of the problem. How do we make this more efficient? Uh, you know maybe it's just me but I do get through like when I get through I get published but it's very very hard to get through and to know should I take the time? Mm -hmm. I mean this is like I'm constantly every minute of the day trying to decide how am I going to use this minute. Uh, effectively, and how should I spend my time? And so I think those mechanisms you just raised is really an important question for us here. How do we uh, make this process more efficient somehow uh, or predictable? Do you guys want to? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say that's a question not limited to academia. It's a question for any profession that cares about broader issues in life. And so I think it's more useful to sort of look at, you know, what broadly do you want to do? Like, who do you want to reach ultimately? Um, I think it's less an issue, you know, you're presenting it as an individual problem, which of course everyone who's experiencing it experiences it as an individual problem. But the problem is the incentive structure within tenure track academic jobs, which does not reward all of these efforts as something that will lead to financial stability and promotion. And so I think the, you know, the pressure should be on them to change that system because, you know, that's where you wouldn't have this issue. These wouldn't be choices. This would be a natural, you know, progression to public engagement instead of an individual struggle about what to do with your day. And the other way of eliminating that ether is to secure a permanent blogging home. Yeah. And either you put up your own blog, like one of us did, and that turned into other hosted places, or you sell yourself and you say, I'm ready to blog if you're serious and you want to publicly engage. There are many news outlets that are desperate for content from people who can write. And um, yeah, but that the ether is the frustrating part, I would say, of peer review. Um, five days waiting for an, a newspaper editor to turn around to me is a drop in the bucket compared to six months, nine months from a journal editor. Right, I, I, I want to sort of uh, echo that last point, right? The, my, my experiences with the ether are much more associated with peer review because you, you send something in, you get something back three months later, it's okay, maybe we'll see, and then you send it in again, and then you get something back six months later, and well, okay, we didn't like it. And then you have to start all over again. That's, I'm on the ethereal plane dying when that sort of thing <laughs> happens, which is a far cry from, oh, you know, you didn't respond to my op-ed. That kind of sucks. It does suck, but I can do something else. And the peer review system is so much more grinding. I just want to say one thing which touches on this, which is, I, I will say this, in my experience, and I've had this experience mentoring students here at Fletcher as well, part of the issue in terms of dealing with the ether is dealing with the, either the rejection or even the lack of acknowledgement that you sent something in. And what I find is that the people who do relatively well at this don't care, it's not like they don't, it's not like they right. want to be rejected or they thrive in being rejected, but it doesn't scar them to the same extent that it scars others, that there are other people for whom not hearing back or getting rejected for some reason is so crushing that it really does retard them from being able to do it again. Um, and I think that's one of the... the I, I have to say, things. we had this conversation in the break with somebody and they were talking, well, how did you learn to write? I'm like, no, actually, I'm a mediocre writer, except I don't really care that much yeah. about the rejection part. Right. Uh, what happens is, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, this isn't false modesty, really. Uh, what happens is that everything gets rejected and you just send it out again, and then it gets at the hands of a good editor who makes good suggestions, hopefully, and then I don't take it too personally if it's improved. And there's a psychological part to it that I think, I, I, I don't really know how to explain. It's exactly what you yeah. said. 
But um, the Paul Krugman had this uh, op-ed on after the Kristoff. We keep referring to Mr. Kristoff, but um, that I really liked. He said even having a prize only gets you a hearing. It doesn't get um, like you listen to. And I'm like, okay, if Paul Krugman's Nobel Prize only does that for him, I'm happy. If I'm not even getting that, you know, if that's uh, the thing is, nobody really completely succeeds. I don't know where I internalized this. If Krugman's not succeeding, and you know, he's got the top you know, <laughs> his prize, he's got the books, he's got the weekly New York Times op-ed column. If he's frustrated about not being heard, okay, I mean, <laughs> I'll take whatever I've got as a win and just let go. And I think that makes it easier because then you don't have to wonder about what do I do next, which is you just say, all right, I'll just send it someplace else. There's a grind to it and there's something bizarre about it, but you just kind of get used to it. And maybe that's something we can put into our professionalization thing is that the world out there isn't fair and they, yeah, they should respond, but they don't. I part, don't know. I, I'm going to call him Peter, but part of it is also an asymmetry. I remember meeting with the Fletcher students once about they were trying to know how do you publish in a journal or an op-ed or whatever, so on and so forth. And this, I was able to bring a file because this was back in the days, like in the 90s. I kept this since then, you know, of when you get paper rejections, you know, Gosh. not just email. And I had a whole thick, you know, file of every single rejection I had had from like, you know, world <laughs> politics or, or, you know, the New York Times or, you know, whatever you, whatever you name it, I had the rejection. And they never see that necessarily. And they were sort of shocked, wait, you got rejected? You know, you, get, you continue to get rejected? Yeah, we all get rejected. To any heads and freezers along with that file? Sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I throw them away. Uh, Peter, you had a question. So one observation, and oh, actually two observations. The first is there's an irony here about how often the social media panel has talked about a column in the New York Times, which is about <laughs> as old school a medium as there is in this business. So I don't, I, I, someone could write an interesting tweet about that. Someone should. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, the, the, second, the, the second observation is that and this might be as much for the next panel as for this panel, but and this is not a criticism of you, although I'll try to frame it like it is, <laughs> <laughs> that the structure of the conference reminds me of the conversations I had in middle school about how to ask girls out. And what I would do is I'd get together. I the still whole, don't know the answer to that question, yeah. so really it's I it would get together with a whole bunch of other guys who had no experience in this area and would talk uh, about it and we would compare our notes and what we wouldn't do is talk to the uh, to the girls about it <laughs> or talk to guys who have, had been successful in doing this before and that I, I it, it strikes me that that's something similar is happening in this panel it's a panel of social media people talking about the importance of social media It'd be interesting to have someone who thinks social media is a waste of time on the panels uh, and making their case, uh, like to yeah, Peter, possibly. you got the mi you have the mic right now. If you so, want to no, make no, your I, case, I, go I, ahead. But and the same thing though, I think it goes to the larger question, uh, and this is maybe one for for Steve, because uh, I've you, we've all been at similar panels or conferences on bridging the gap, but we're all in agreement, violent agreement about the importance of it. It'd be great to have some of the people that Mike Desch identifies as the problem also in the room to ask them, well, why are you opposed to it? What is, what is their argument against what seems to all of us to be a very sensible case for doing this? Uh, and I'm just, just curious, have you ever been at a conference with somebody arguing, oh, this is a waste of time, you shouldn't be trying to do social media, shouldn't be trying to engage the, the policymaker, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I want to give the mic to Jim Golgeyer, who has a quick response. Yeah. This is, I, uh, you know, I, as many of us did, you know, benefited so much from the Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship. And I once, some years ago, nominated somebody for that fellowship. And, um, you know, the councils let me know that he didn't end up applying. And I happened to be at his department uh, sometime later. And I said to the department chair, you know, really strange thing happened. I nominated one of your junior faculty for Council on International Affairs and International Relations Fellowship. I was really disappointed that he didn't apply. And the person said, yeah. I told him not to. I said, what, are you going to try to ruin your career? I mean, get your academic work done. Don't go off for a year in Washington doing policy. That's crazy. And, well, you know, he got tenure, but 
He never did the fellowship, which I think was really a pity. We want that guy to be in the group. Can I give us your finger on this question as well? Yeah, let's go over there. Sure. You know, just defect, right? <laughs> like, like why, why sort of go with this ruse of you can have it all in, on the academia side, right? That's a one finger. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I like, <laughs> Somebody tweet that, please. That's a nice um, That's you know, I went to ISA for the first time in a decade this year to recruit defectors, right? Like, I mean, there were some really interesting panels, actually, on forecasting, which most academic systems they refuse to do. Um, but, you know, there's, 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 no, there's plenty of work, right? There's interesting work. The... Academia is a lifestyle in this regard. It's a wonderful lifestyle if you're lucky enough to get the gold ring. You know, I have to like go to work every single day, whether there's class or not, right? To balance the budget and do payroll every month, whether there's class or not. So there's there is a difference, you know, you know, piece, you know, to this of if you want to do policy, direct policy engaged work, there's not a requirement that you do it from academia and try to do the whole piece. You can defect. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of two fingers, so uh, I'm going to defer to my colleague. Carolyn is, you know, uh, back there, and then we'll go Mia and Jessica. Okay, so this is, um, I'm Carolyn Gideon. I'm on the faculty here, and I am still tenure track. And so this is my life, and the thing is, Kelly talked about efficiency, and now we're talking about um, people who are saying this isn't work, and this also echoes this whole philosophy behind the Tobin project, everything is is posed as a risk to somebody like me. Okay, so there's um, there's the Fletcher tenure process, and yes, Fletcher does actually value engagement, and there's always this temptation to engage because that's what we do here, and we're, we're engaging all the time with students who are going to go off into these positions, but there's also that advice that you're given, like not applying for this fellowship. There's that advice of not engaging because you need to get more publication, so that's the 24 hour a day constraint that you need to be working on something, and then there's also the fact that if you don't get tenure at the Fletcher School or someplace that does value engagement, you need to be attractive to someplace else if, in fact, you want to be in academia. And again, yes, we could say, okay, there are other ways to engage that are not academia, which is absolutely true, and I remind myself of that every night when I go to bed and I feel like I didn't do enough. But the fact is we all chose to come do our work in academia for a reason, whether it's the intellectual freedom, you know, the ability to work on our own agenda and not have to worry about making money for our publication or making our donors happy. Um, you know, for whatever reason, we chose to come to academia for a reason, feeling like this is where the work we could produce would be engaging. But it's even more than the time constraint and the efficiency, it's that sense of risk. And I think the first time I saw this articulated well was in Dan's blog when you were still at University of Chicago, just before you came to the Fletcher School and that whole issue of, you know, how does a blog impact a tenure decision? And there are two sides to that. It can make your work a lot better because you're getting, you're opening up to that wider peer review in a much faster pace, but then there's also, you're being evaluated often by the people who are not in the room to tell us why we shouldn't be engaging in social media and then how and that idea in the Tobin project the idea that well if you're engaging in real policy issues and on an everyday basis with policymakers that you're sacrificing something in your intellectual integrity so I think that comes right down to the incentive system and it's something I feel like is a struggle every day. I mean, what is the solution to that other than, you know, the middle finger solution of <laughs> leaving academia? The one finger solution. Right. Okay, Mia. So I partly want to respond to Aaron's point about why not defect. I think, and this relates to an earlier panel when uh, Mike Desch was discussing about um, having students that don't want to go into the academy and you know, these are not rationally calculated decisions to spend multiple years to get a job that my undergraduate students make more than I will um, at graduation if they get a good one. So the answer is going to surprise most of you. Why do we do it? We do it for the love. We do it because for the same reason people enter the priesthood, 
for the same people make, for the same reason that people make sacrifices. We got into this because probably everybody in this room could have gotten a job that paid six or seven or eight figures on Wall Street, gone to law school, all of our parents would have been very happy, especially mine, would have been very happy had I made that choice. But the fact remains is that we felt it was a calling. And I think that the reason why people have this idea that the defection or the single finger response or why don't we just you know forget it and just go work for a Beltway Bandit is because we got into it for one reason and getting out of it is very tough. And admitting, because for in some ways, even though I had colleagues at Columbia who got their PhD, went into the private sector, and, and had fabulous jobs, they felt they'd failed because they hadn't become an academic, they didn't produce the articles, they didn't write the books. And I think that you know, at the end of the day, we do it because we love the students. We do it because the metric of my success is only measured in part by, um, certainly by my publications or by my Wikipedia page. But it's also measured by the fact that over 20 years of teaching, I've had amazing students and now they're doing amazing work. And you can hire them. <laughs> Jessica, Jessica, you had a... Yeah. So Peter's comment about, is there anybody who thinks that social media is a waste of time? And I, I will not be that person. Um, but it's somebody who is often asked by faculty about um, how to effectively use social media. Or, you know, I'm on Twitter. What now? Um, there, there are um, some, there have gotten feedback, and I do believe that social media should be organic, it, that it has to be organic, that you have to really want to engage on a daily basis, multiple times a day, with the audience you're trying to reach, and you have to enjoy that. And I think compensation is part of the issue. How is that valued? How is time spent conducting that activity um, in academia? How do we, how do we value that is an excellent question, but my question for the panel is, is it an activity that can and should be encouraged and taught to uh, academics who, for whom which it's not, doesn't come naturally? Um, yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Actually, first on the whole social media is a waste of time, we should have people representing that view. Generally speaking, you know, as we were saying, if you don't enjoy doing something, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to be the most informed person on it. And so somebody who thinks social media is a waste of time is most likely not spending a lot of time on social media. And so I'm not really sure what value, um, you know, that opinion would be unless they're just a, you know, very dedicated masochist. Uh, in terms of whether people should be trained... Have you met the rest of the academy? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, there's probably a lot of good contenders. Um, in terms of whether people should be trained to use social media, I don't think you know, social media should be viewed as that fundamentally different from any kind of form of communication or writing. People should be trained to write clearly. People should be trained to express their opinions well in a way that you know, the average person can comprehend. Whether or not that happens through social media or through print media is, is really up to them. I think social media offers an opportunity for people to do that for free and to be able to experiment with different formats, different character limitations, different audience responses in a way that will ultimately improve their writing. Well, can I add yeah. a few things? Go ahead. I don't know if this is on or not. Um, well, Go. so the training part, there's definitely, uh, I think, practices that people can share. It's just like any other form of communication and every platform has its um, peculiarities and it's not for everyone. I think for me, Twitter or long form is it. I either want to write like 4,000 word pieces or I want to tweet. For other people, like there's a thousand word sort of soft spot that they do and they all have different strengths and weaknesses. It depends on your field. You know, I'd like I'm going to give a non-social science example. There's an enormous amount of there's an enormous amount of blogging in the string theory. Thank you. There's an enormous <laughs> amount of blogging in the physics community in things like string theory, which is really complicated and lots of messy things going on. And they preprint their um, papers and archive, and then there's these bloggers who take some of the preprints on the latest things on string theory in physics and there's a very lively community. You cannot be a scholar in this, you know, 2014 probably, 
of string theory in physics and not be following the top blogs. It's, that's not the model that's going to work for other fields. So I think every field can say, so how, how do we uh, engage this and how do we do that? Now, the interesting thing about some of these fields, it's like, you know, physicists never hold physics matter conferences. It's only the social <laughs> sciences that hold, you know, we matter conferences because we're not sure we matter. And I think that's the problem um, more than anything else. You know, they blog. They don't worry about it. Uh, there's rampant blogging across the natural sciences. It's just become integrated into some of the most complicated fields that require some of the hardest sort of barriers to entry, and they don't spend whole days wondering if it's worth it. They just do their thing. And I feel like, you know, no, no, the North Carolina state motto is apparently to be rather than to seem. And I think that's the good thing. You know, if we want to do something, I think we should just try it and see how it works, and not everybody's going to like the same format, and then learn about it. The problem still remains the budget problem, 24 hours a day, who gets left out, all of that too. But I, I, I don't really have an answer to where all our self-doubt and question is coming from, but I think the more we get out into the public, I constantly get told, oh, this is so great, this is so brilliant, and as I said, it's usually very basic stuff that every <laughs> academic colleague of mine would know, and it took me some effort to overcome that. Like, I'd be writing something for a publication, I'd be thinking, this is so obvious, everybody's gonna laugh at me, everybody knows this. I had to train myself out of that everybody being, like the people in my head when I write public, they are no longer my colleagues because they would say, why are you writing this? We all know this. And then I overcome that and write it and everybody goes, oh wow, nobody knows. I'm like, well, that's because I'm the one speaking to it. It's not because I'm particularly you know, exceptional in that. So those mindset differences, I think, would make a big difference. This is the classic, you just described sort of the classic junior professor problem, which is assuming that everyone else in the world is a third year PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rob, and, yeah, Rob and then Mira. Uh, sort of going back to uh, Peter's initial question and then to uh, the comment, is that Kelly over there? Yeah, oh, Kelly. Oh, yeah. To, to Kelly's uh, uh, comments. Uh, the reason why it's such a struggle to find somebody and put them on a panel saying that they hate blogging and social media is because the advice that is given to junior faculty is usually delivered in a passive aggressive tone um, that people aren't going to take this seriously. Not, I don't take this seriously. People aren't going to take this seriously. <laughs> this is not something that's going to help you get tenure. This is not something that's going to help you get a job. Because nobody really, you know, you really shouldn't blog until you get tenure. You shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And so the argument is rarely made and very out and straightforward that this has no value, right? That this is not something that has scholarly value. And it's really not something even tenured faculty should be doing, right? Tenured faculty are wasting their time if they start a blog. Um, and I think related to that, you know, I think unfortunately we sort of have a defensive tendency, those of us who think that social media does matter and that blogging does matter, and even who would go so far as to say it is something and public engagement is something that should be taken seriously in a tenure case, we sometimes have a defensive way of phrasing our response to that passive aggressiveness, right? That, oh, well, you do need to get all of your other requirements in before you start blogging, right? You can't let that take away one, those two hours of the day because you do have to get these three PRs in. Um, or a recent, uh, set of, uh, recent debate on Twitter which was about, you know, does it make sense for junior faculty to publish a chapter in a, uh, an edited volume? Is that going to help you for tenure? And it, it ended up being a nonsensical conversation because the best arguments made against publishing a chapter in an edited volume would apply to, you know, it goes away into a book that cost $180 and that nobody's ever going to see, right? That's a great reason not to contribute a chapter to an edited volume, but it applies to tenured faculty too, right? But nobody's, a, there seems to be a reluctance to step up and be fairly straightforward and actually have that argument, and that argument is necessary in order to change the norms um, of uh, how and why we value certain sorts of contribution for professional advancement. Yeah, a few points uh, by way of summing up. First thing is I want to give a hat tip, I believe that's a Twitter term, often known as HT, to my co-author of the PS article that Dan referred to, and that is Brent Sassley at University of Texas at Arlington. And we together, on social media, off social media, in print, in journals, and in blogs, 
uh, have been wrestling with these ideas of scholar blogger identities and bringing in ethno-national subjectivities when we're talking about conflict zones. And one more HT, and that was to Rob Farley, who had an earlier piece in PS to which our piece was responding, and Dan Dresner and Charlie, so you guys had a piece. But point is, is that what, one nice thing I see is that we scholar bloggers, those who are passionate about doing this kind of thing, are starting to also engage the academic audience. So we're succeeding in building a bridge in that way through the pages of journals. In terms of defecting, what Aaron said, it's, it's very, um, it, it can sound very appealing. I guess my main concern is, are we talking about defecting to a policy think tank? That's one thing that people are being drawn to in this room. I'm not. What kind of defecting were you talking about? Anything else, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, so that's the question. So for me, my passion right now, my professional passion, aside from all my hobbies and whatever outside, my professional passion is the 750 word written form, sometimes 785. Ha very hard to make a living doing that. Um, even if you find a paid outlet, it's just nice latte money to supplement the main income, which is being a professor. I also love teaching. I love Did research. Did you just call it latte money? I just want to be sure I got that term. Well, on a good day, it's okay. latte money. On a okay. bad day, yeah. it's my it's my. No, I like that phrase. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, yeah, there's sort of a, a range there. So it's very hard to find, make a living doing that. And, and be, also, even if we were to make a living doing that, we wouldn't have the scholarly credentials to back up our 750 word writing. So there is a, um, a feedback, positive in a way, and a necessary feedback loop. Mike Desch, I believe it was, who said we have to change the norms because the norm, was it Mike, who said the norms of our discipline are self-reinforcing and so therefore they can be changed. And there, I, I don't know if he said self-reinforcing or self-enforcing, but I like both and I tweeted both formulations. We are caught in our own norms, but we can also change them. I mean, I'm a norm change optimist, I guess you could say. So what do we do? What did I help do this year at my, in my faculty? I helped create a new award. We already have a teaching award, a research award, all that stuff. Created a new award called Excellence in Public Commentary. These are ways to reward our own faculty internally so that when files go out for tenure promotion or external awards or whatever it is, there is something on file. I don't think I'm going to apply because ever because the uh, candidates are too darn strong, as I saw this year. So the point is there's excellent work going on. This is the first year of the award, and people have already been doing it and been showing that they're doing it really well. Um, in terms of students and op-eds and getting them used to social media, um, I think we should, in terms of changing the norms, I think we should be thinking about doing that in the classroom as well, if we're not already. I sometimes assign a social media project, get them to create a Twitter account on an issue they're passionate about. It works okay, depends, you know, they're first year students, there's a lot going on in that class. Also, I always assign many op-eds to read in addition to academic peer review articles, and I always assign students to write at least one op-ed. I tell them it's more likely when they leave these doors, they will be more likely writing an op-ed than an academic essay ever again. I want them to start to own that kind of writing, and, um, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for just one last question. Uh, Mike Horowitz had his hand up. and so, You sure? You're absolutely sure? Uh, Aaron? Uh, so I'm Aaron Malas. I'm a second year PhD student here. Um, and I actually had a question that was very specifically about Twitter. Um, and I'm wondering if any of the panelists um, have found I don't want to say adverse necessarily, but how it affects their attention span and the need to respond to things with greater immediacy. Um, one of my concerns, I guess, is that with I'm the sorry, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. With, with, with the, with the focus on, on responding as, as soon as possible, <laughs> no, uh, whether that takes you away from some of the reflection that you'd want to do otherwise, that's maybe a little bit easier to do when blogging and, and other forms of social media. I mean, this is like everything else. I think maybe you, you just train yourself either to or not to. I mean, this is something I, I'm just trying to understand. It doesn't just happen to you. Like, if you don't want to respond, you can say, okay, I'm just not going to engage this and not engage right now because I blog about social movements and it ha because it happened in my country of origin. You can imagine that I get a lot of very negative <laughs> harassment would be a mild term for what some of what I get and I there's a mute function I just mute it I don't block people and I don't ever see it I mean this, these are I mean, sometimes social media gets portrayed as this environment which kind of comes and jumps you and makes you do things that you wouldn't want to do there's no reason for it to be there are lots of ways to engage it and if I, I am not liking a conversation I say I'm not gonna do this 
and I sometimes say, okay, this is an important point, but I'm going to write a 4,000 word article on it, or I send people to my academic art. So you don't, there's, you don't have to just sort of get on this somebody's wrong on the internet mindset at 11.30 p.m. Uh, before going to bed, as <laughs> you were saying, you can do that. And just one thing I wanted to sort of uh, really appreciated the comment about encouraging people. That's, that's what I'm going to close on. I've been really supported by my department chairs, deans, provosts, along the way, more than anybody else almost. I mean, when my peers were wondering, what the heck are you doing? My provost was like, this is great, keep it up. Uh, it really helped me sort of be a little bit of an experimentalist in trying things out. So I want to give a shout out to people thinking about how do we incentivize it. Just going up and saying, look, I'm reading your stuff and we appreciate the fact that you're putting the name of our school out there and showing the relevance of academia when I'm arguing with state legislatures on when we should be funded. It, that made me feel, you know, this is how I ended up doing all the things I do try as a junior faculty. So there is, you know, it's, she's totally right. We can change the culture, you know, and faculty have more freedom to change their culture than I think they realize. Okay, I want to give everyone one good final coffee break so that everyone is alert for the last panel. So I'd like to thank all the panelists. We got coffee and then we'll be back in 15. I certainly need more coffee.